and I serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Diversity at New York University. And welcome to the John Carlos story. You, yes, indeed. <clears throat> Uh, you know, Mr. Carlos, I googled your name. I put in, here I am. I put in your name, Mr. Carlos, which took me to Wikipedia. And this is what I found. The protest. On the morning of October 16, 1968, U.S. athlete Tommy Smith won the 200 meter race in a world record time of 19.83 seconds, with Australia's Peter Norman second with a time of 20.06 seconds, and the US's John Carlos in third place with a time of 20.10 seconds. That's fabulous, right? <laughs> so after the race was completed, the three went to collect their medals at the podium. The two U.S. athletes received their medals shoeless, but wearing black socks to represent black poverty. Smith wore a black scarf around his neck to represent black pride. Carlos had his tr tracksuit top unzipped to show solidarity with all blue-collar workers in the U.S and wore a necklace of beads, which he described, quote, were for those individuals that were lynched or killed and that no one said a prayer for, that were hung and tarred. It was for those thrown off the side of the boats in the middle passage. All three athletes wore Olympic Project for Human Rights badges after Norman, a critic of Australia's white Australian policy expressed empathy with their ideals. Sociologist Harry Edwards, the founder of OPHR, had urged black athletes to boycott the games. Reported, reportedly, the actions of Smith and Carlos on October 16, 1968 were inspired by Edwards' arguments. Both U.S athletes intended on bringing black gloves to the event, but Carlos forgot his, leaving them in the Olympic Village. It was his friend Peter Norman who suggested that he wear Smith's left-handed glove, this being the reason behind Mr. Carlos raising his left hand as opposed to his right, differing from the traditional black power salute. When the Star Spangled Banner played, Smith and Carlos delivered the salute with heads bowed, a gesture which became front page news around the world. As they left the podium, they were booed by the crowd. Smith later said, if I win, I am American, not a black American. But if I did something bad, then they would say I am a Negro. We are black and we are proud of being black, black America, will understand what we did tonight, unquote. That was all in Wikipedia. Uh, so this evening, we don't have to look for you on Wikipedia because you are here with us tonight to share your story. Also, here's your co-author, David Zirin, host of the weekly show, Edge of Sports Radio, and columnist for Slam Magazine, also writes about the politics of sports for the Nation Magazine as its first sports writer in its 150 years of existence. We could do that. <clears throat> we also have Dr. Cornell West, scholar, author, He's also a speaker, he's a teacher, and an actor. Described as one of America's most provocative public intellectuals. And Mr. Car Carlos, what you all share in common is you, about to share with us the John Carlos story. Dr. West, in the preface, describes your book as, 
quote, the tale of a strong black man who overcame forces trying to crush him, still on fire for justice. Millery Polonais, scholar, author, and assistant professor of American studies in NYU's Gallatin division, excuse me, Gallatin School, will take us to the next step in this very exciting evening with the three of you. Alan McFarlane, NYU's assistant vice president for student diversity, will add in notes. Sit back, relax, take notes. We're in for a very exciting time. Take your shoes off, make yourself at home. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is indeed a pleasure. I want to welcome all the, 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 our esteemed panelists uh, on the stage here. And first of all, I'll just say thank you to NYU, thank you to the Office of Student Diversity, um, and many, many of the other uh, offices and organizations that sponsor this event. Um, it's indeed an honor to, to be here with you. Uh, as a student of uh, African American studies, Caribbean intellectual history, um, being on the stage with Dr. West is, is really an honor, and it's been a privilege. Um, as a student of, 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 of US history and US politics, um, without a doubt, being on the stage with John Carlos is uh, indeed an honor and a privilege. Um, and as a student of uh, sports, and someone who's uh, an avid uh, watcher of, <laughs> of many different sports, uh, but also interested in the writing and the politics. I teach a, a course on sports, race, and politics. Being on the stage with uh, Dave Zirin is absolutely um, a privilege also. Uh, what I want to just basically say is that over the next um, hour or so, um, you, all of you will be uh, pleased and, and, and happy to hear many of the wonderful things that these individuals will, will say. And uh, Dave will uh, speak first for uh, 12 to 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have uh, Dr. West talk a little bit about his foreword uh, of the John Car Carlos story, and then um, the man himself, John Carlos, will um, take some time and, and talk about his life. Uh, so Dave, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Thank you so much, good doctor. It's really great to be here. I'm from New York City. And, yeah. and uh, being up here tonight, it reminds me of something that happened to me when I was uh, 12, 13 years old in this city. There, I went to a, a hip hop concert, and I went to see a group that you might have heard of called Run DMC. <laughs> Any love for Run DMC here? And, <laughs> and they had an opening group that night who was also on their label that no one ever heard of, known as the Beastie Boys. <laughs> now, no one knew who the Beastie Boys were, so people booed, people threw things, and people said, get off the stage, we're not here to see you. Now, I say that just to say that I am <laughs> very aware. Work it, work it, brother Dave, work it, brother. That tonight. That's <laughs> nice. I am a beastie. <laughs> and you are here to see Run DMC. <laughs> now, I want to start my remarks, though, by saying that Monday night, I had the privilege of being downtown to see Dr. John Carlos address the General Assembly at Occupy Wall Street. And it was an amazing moment for people who've seen it. The fact that John Carlos was there was picked up by the New York Times, the Daily News, El País, El Preganero, El Figaro. I mean, pr pretty much everything but, but Us Weekly. Didn't include that. And it was even picked up by USA Today, which had the great headline, Famous Olympic Protester Helps Occupy Wall Street. Now, when we showed up there that night, I mean, the reaction was amazing. People born decades after that seminal moment in 1968, their eyes lit up. They rearranged the whole agenda to give John Carlos five minutes to address them. And 
it spoke to me because as John and I were writing this book, I kept asking myself this question. Why is it that 43 years later, we still care so much about this moment? I mean, there are a lot of things from the late 60s we don't care too much about. You know, nobody's packing NYU to see Country Joe and the Fish. But, and yet people, sorry. Okay, and yet people, <laughs> who? <laughs> and, yet, and yet people literally, their, their eyes lit up when they heard that John Carlos, and all, all I had to do was go up to the head facilitator and said, John Carlos, 68 Olympics, this. And they said, okay, let's get him up there to speak right now. And so why does it still resonate so many years later? I think it goes back to what the provost said in the introduction, because on that medal stand, you had a black glove to symbolize resistance to racism, no shoes to protest poverty in the black community. John Carlos had an open jacket to protest the way working people, black and white, are underappreciated in this country, and beads to protest the history of lynching. Think about those issues for a second. Violence, poverty, racism, the underappreciation of working people. Now, is that 1968 or is that 2011? You see what I'm saying? And, and John, as he did so well, and as he's done so well, as we've been going around talking about this book, captured the moment perfectly. He stood up there, and with that, you know, people know the human microphone getting repeated and repeated up there. He said, I am here for you. Why? Because I am you. We're here 43 years later because there's a fight still to be won. Mm. This day is not for us, but for our children to come. And the reaction was, was, just, was just unbelievable. And it was even better the next day when uh, John was on Morning Joe and a couple other MSNBC shows talking about his experience at Occupy Wall Street and was asked the question, like, how is now different from then? And John said, well, back then we were trying to fight this racial problem, but you know what? Now with this economic problem, it seems like all of us are getting messed over by this system. And at MSNBC, they were like, this system? What, pray tell, do you mean this system? You know? <laughs> and the best part was when we're in the green room and who's there, but uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, another person very familiar with Wall Street, albeit not the occupied part. And, um, <laughs> And Chuck Schumer went, went up to John and, and, and looked at him up and down and shook his hand and says, hey, you look like you could be still running. You know. And John looks at him. There's a beautiful pause, and he says, running for justice. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's nice. That, that, I, I can imagine. John just said, Dave's going to get my phone tap. That's what John just said. <laughs> um, no, he didn't. I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but while, while we are thrilled that young people today are so entranced by that moment in 1968, we wrote this book because we want people to know that it was more than just a moment. It was a movement called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And they stood for things. They stood for things that now make perfect sense. And yet back then they were vilified and attacked for. They stood for things like disinviting South Africa and Rhodesia from the Olympics because these were apartheid countries. They stood for restoring Muhammad Ali's title, which had been stripped from him because of his opposition to the war in Vietnam. They stood for hiring more African-American coaches for the Olympic Games. And lastly, they stood for firing Avery Brundage as head of the International Olympic Committee. Now, yeah, that's true. If you know anything about the history of Avery Brundage, you know that that wasn't only appropriate, but just. An open bigot, an open racist, an open anti-Semite. And what these guys said is they said, their, their founding statement, they said, why should we run in Mexico only to crawl home? And what they fought for was this idea of a boycott, of saying, let's remove all the African-American athletes from the Olympic Games, and let's see how good the US does then. Let's see how good the glory of the US is in track and field without African-American athletes. Let's do that. Now, the boycott didn't happen. And it didn't happen for two reasons. One is a very good reason, that for the first time, the International Olympic Committee actually buckled and disinvited South Africa and Rhodesia from the games in 68 as a concession. But the second reason was that unlike John Carlos, unlike Tommy Smith, unlike Lee Evans, most of the track and field athletes said, well, gee, I've been training my whole life for this medal. I don't think I can boycott. And John Carlos' argument back was to say, well, how's that medal going to feed your kids? How's that medal going to feed the kids in your community? 
What are you going to do a year from now, two years from now, when that medal is done? Because you know they're making millions of dollars at these Olympic Games, and you don't see any of it. The reason why they have these Olympics every four years is it takes four years to count the money. That's, that's John's line, not mine. I, I only steal from smart people. Now, yeah, co-op, thank you, Glenn. That's a much better phrase. <laughs> Tribute, sample, if you will. Um, <laughs> But, but the bigger issue is then John was faced with this question, do I boycott anyway? Or do I go down there with Tommy Smith, run the 200 meters and represent myself the way I wanna be represented? So John and Tommy went down there, they were ready for the final race and they had their plan, they had their beads, they had their gloves, they had the plan with the shoes, all of it. Yet there's only one thing they had to do beforehand. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> you gotta get on that platform, right? And that's where John Carlos engaged in, and I'm saying this to all the sports people here, not to the political people here, engaged in one of the most audacious athletic feats in the history of professional and amateur sports. And I mean that. Go to, go to YouTube and look up that 200 meter race. And you'll see John Carlos, first of all, for any, any track and field fans here? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on the gentleman right here, all right. Just tell everybody, good or not good, John Carlos could run 100 yards in 8.8 .8 seconds. Good or not good? Correct. Good. Yeah, good, that's right. <laughs> and so you watch this race, you see what John Carlos does. He runs out, and the first thing they tell you when you run short sprints is where's your head always supposed to face? Forward. Forward. Thank you again, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and what John is constantly doing as he's running this race is he sets the pace, he has the lead after 100 meters, and he's constantly looking backwards for Tommy Smith. Constantly looks back one, two, three, four times looking back. And at one point he even looks back and he says, come on Tommy, stop bullshitting. Because <laughs> Tommy's got to speed up to do it. Then bam, they, go, they finally, Tommy gets his Tommy legs going, breaks, the, that's what they were called. They break the tape and they both get on this stand. Then they go up to that stand and had their plan but there was another issue they had to confront in their own minds, and that was the very real thought in their <coughs> brains that they could go up on that stand and be shot down. Now, if that sounds weird or conspiratorial or unrealistic, think about 1968 for a second. Think about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, and most pressing, I know in John Carlos's mind, the fact that hundreds, if not several thousand Mexican students were slaughtered in the days before the games, and what's known as the, in Mexico as the massacre of Talata Loco Square. Mm. This was on their minds. So Tommy even looked at John and he said, my, my, what, what are we gonna do if someone shoots at us when we're up there? And John said, well, you know we're trained to listen for the gun. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we're fast. <laughs> so we'll do our best. And they got up there and they raised their fists. And as John says in the book, I took his words verbatim. He said, when they raised their fists in that stadium, you could have heard a frog piss on cotton. That's how soft it was at that time. And then, and then the booze started and the garbage started coming down. And that was day one of a terrible price that they tried to extract from John oh, no. Carlos yes. over the next 30, 40 years mm. for daring to stand up, for daring to stand for what he believed in, for daring to be heroic, for daring to not read from the script, and for daring to be a hero to future fighters for social justice. Now, Keep working, and, Dave. and that brings great. back to my last point, because I know I need to sit, because I, I am the beastie boy here, and I know who you're here <laughs> to see run DMC up here. But to, to make this last point, it gets back to that question, why is it we still care 43 years later? And that question for me as I was doing the book the John, with John was actually answered, not at Occupy Wall Street, but it was answered the night of September 21st when Troy Anthony Davis was legally lynched by the state of Georgia. On that night, and John Carlos and I have both done work for some time on Troy Davis's case, it was, it was one of the most awful nights uh, of my life, I'll be very frank about that. On that night of September 21st, I'll never forget, I was out in front of the Supreme Court about 11 o'clock at night, and there was a young woman there, a young African-American woman who I know, she's a poet, and she, she had tears running down her face, and she said to me, if there's one thing that this country seems to fear, if there's one thing that power in this country seems to fear, it's a free black man. 
And I think the reason why we still look at that image from 68, the reason why it still inspires young people today is that when you see them up there on that metal stand, when you see them with their heads bent, you know in your heart when you see that that they are nothing if not free. Thank you very much. My man, my man. Wonderful. My man, right on. Wonderful, buddy. Right on. Oh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Yeah, if you were Beastie Boy, then I'm Eddie Kendricks, and he's David Ruffin. <laughs> <laughs> Head of the Temptations. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to be brief as well, but I just want to say that I am profoundly moved to be here. John Carlos is one of the few world historical figures of the last 50 years. There's no doubt about that. And I'm just so blessed that he is my brother. I love him, and he loves me. And that makes a big difference in my life. I tried to be an athlete when I was young. I set a couple of city records, but I didn't go national and international. <laughs> <laughs> but we looked up to the Lee Evanses, the John Carlos. Tommy Smith's, and Ralph Boston's, and a whole wave of athletes. And it had to do with self-respect, it had to do with self-confidence, and it had to do with self-regard. And when you look up to those persons who exemplify what the Greeks call arate, excellence at the highest level, who are worthy of honor, Mm. owing to their achievement, which could be denied by no one. That makes a difference, especially on the chocolate side of town, <laughs> where you were told that you were less beautiful and less moral and less intelligent. You were told to hate yourself, and yet, lo and behold, here's these persons who are exemplifying the highest level of excellence. So one of the reasons why, my dear brother, Dr. John Carlos, brother John Carlos, comrade John Carlos, so deeply moves me is that he exemplifies a pursuit for excellence. And that's very important to keep in mind in a market-driven society where you can be successful but not necessarily be excellent. You can be a star but not, not necessarily be excellent. You can be a celebrity and not necessarily be excellent. Mm -hmm. Just getting over. John Carlos never, ever just tried to get over. He's one of the greatest athletes from this state. Most of you probably didn't know he was a swimming champion before he even put foot on the track. But white supremacist sensibilities and practices made it difficult for a black man to be the best swimmer outside of New York City. So he said, let me pick up another sport. And look what he does. <laughs> One of the fastest human beings in the history of the species. Can you imagine what he would have been like in water? <laughs> <laughs> if white supremacy hadn't got in the way. And this is very important, because anytime you're talking about black excellence, you're talking about also the wasted potentials that are unable to be realized because of white supremacist barriers. And you got to try something else. And you still end up world historical athlete. But he went beyond being an athlete, and this is something we need to accent in 2011, because we got so many athletes who are just up for sale, like politicians. Yeah. Mm. Right. Up for sale. I go for the highest bidder. No, I'm not only in the involved in the quest for excellence, but I got something called integrity. I got a sense of myself. I'm not going to sell myself for anything. When I hit the tape, I'm still going to be free the way Brother Dave put it. And that's a rare thing these days. And yes, it's true that in 1968, you had young people, you had workers and a variety of others. They were occupying Mexico City, they were occupying Prague, they were occupying Paris, mm -hmm. they were occupying Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles and Harlem. Why? Because just like 2011, moral outrage was overflowing owing to the suffering that had been denied by a status quo and something needed to be done. There was a state of emergency. There was a sense <coughs> of urgency. And how rare it is for those who are able 
to achieve excellence and then celebrity status to say, I'm going to put all of this at risk because I believe in something deeper than just the prizes that I win. Muhammad Ali was another. Mm -hmm. Oh, we love Brother Muhammad Ali. It's true, not just excellent, but give up the title. Why? Because I've got some beliefs and convictions. 2011, occupy 800 cities right now all around the world, hungry for connecting the quest for excellence with a sense of integrity. What kind of person do you want to be? And you read his book to find out what went into this brother, family, community, communal institutions, shaping and molding his soul, which meant he had a profound human value never determined by a market price. Mm. Never determined by a market price. We need so much of that today. That's one reason why you got that response on Occupy Wall Street. Because wherever John Carlos goes, they say, my God, my God. There goes an exemplar of excellence. There goes an exemplar of courage. There goes an exemplar of integrity in, well, against the backdrop of organized and mobilized People, those slash stone call everyday people. Right. Organize and mobilize and want, wanting to be a part of that organizing and that mobilizing. Last but not least, and I'm going to sit down, <laughs> that there's a depth of spirituality in Brother Dr. Comrade John Carter. And by spirituality, what I mean is what Du Bois calls striving in the classic of 1903 of Souls of Black Folk. By spirituality, I mean a willingness to look catastrophe in the face and steal with a style and a love <coughs> and a willingness to even die. You hold your head up high and your back up straight and you take your stand the way Sly Stone talked about stand two years later in his classic. Stand tall. Stand with dignity. Stand with integrity alongside others. That takes a spirituality. And you're going to see rich spirituality in this text. It's almost like a blues-like spirituality. Because the blues is about catastrophe, right? Autobiographical chronicle of a personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. It responds to the catastrophe in song, in word, in bodily disposition, and in organization of self and of community. And that's a beautiful thing to behold. And believe me, 43 years later, when your body is a culinary delight of terrestrial worms, but your soul is still strong. Mm -hmm. They're going to talk about John Carlos because when you exemplify excellence, courage, fortitude, and have a deep spirituality, no matter how many lies are thick at the moment, that kind of truth crushed the earth will rise again. And that's what we're talking about today at NYU. This particular truth rising again in 2011, 43 years later, seeing you all there looks like it was just yesterday. 43 years, my God. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, you're the bomb. You're the bomb. You're the bomb. <laughs> wow. Well, first, let me, let me just say uh, it's really been a great trip for me, a, a, a marvelous trip, a nostalgic trip, a loving trip, uh, a caring trip. Mm. I come back to my home, to New York City, to run up and down the streets of New York, to experience the things that I experienced as a young, young, young individual. To have the mother and father that I had in trying times to teach me about values, morals, respect, and character, mm -hmm. self-worth. My mother and father taught me this at a very early age, and 
by the grace of God, I was able to teach them something at a very early age as well. Mm. Let me go on this trip that Dr. West was talking about. And let me see you explain to you, maybe you could take this trip with me through my eyes. I was born and raised in New York City. I was born in Lincoln Hospital. Unfortunately, I couldn't make Harlem Hospital. They had a busy day that day. <laughs> so we matriculated on over to Lincoln. But prior to me being born, my mother had some problems. She had this baby that was pretty stubborn and made up its mind as to where and how it wanted to come into this world. And when she get, went to get checked by the doctor, the doctor told my mom, say, Mrs. Carlos, this baby didn't turn itself around or turn itself around. And we're concerned about the baby coming out injured or deformed based on the way you might give deliverance to this baby. So we're going to do this procedure and turn the baby back around. Well, the doctor turned my, my, my body back around. By the time I got home or by the time my mother got back, back home, three four hours later, I done made the move and turned back to where I wanted to go. <laughs> well, this didn't happen one time. It actually happened three times. The doctor told my mother, said, Mrs. Carlos, this baby seemed like it's pretty adamant about where he wants to come or how she wants to come. And we just better leave it alone. Now, when I came into the world, I didn't come feet first. I didn't come head first. I came butt first. Booty first. It's almost like I was backing out. <laughs> but at the same time, when backing out, when you come out butt first, you got this U shape. And imagine the U-shape relative to me in my mind at that young time ex extravagated to my brain, unity. I grew up with the thought that unity plays a big part in society. I began to realize early that we was a mix. Like I look in this audience here, I see a lot of black people, I see a lot of white people, I see a lot of Hispanic people, I see Jamaicans in here, and I might even see some of my folks, some Cubans in here. That's the way Harlem was when I came in in the 40s. We were all happy. It was like a fruit bowl. Everybody got along. We understood which, which other roles that we had. And then all of a sudden, it became this domesticated workers syndrome. All the people of color, that's what the jobs we had. I remember my mom and my auntie used to go to the abortion clinics, and that was their job to clean up the afterbirth. My job was to look and see what these doctors were sniffing on because I used to open their drawers. I'm looking, I'm curious, I want to see what's happening. And he used to have white powder in there. And I asked my mother, what's this white powder? I put it on my lip, my lip got like frozen. What's going on? My mother, mother, mother said, well, son, uh, the doctors, you know, she tried to be all professional. Well, the doctors are doing surgery in there and they need this surgery to keep them sharp and keep them alert. Well, I listened to that and I said, okay, let me go on with that. But then I remember one day I woke up and they had this thing called wagon train white flight. All of the white folks decided, looked like they had a secret meeting, decided we are going to leave Harlem tomorrow. <laughs> Be on time. <laughs> <laughs> they got up and they packed up. Now as a young age, I'm trying to matriculate my mind, why are they leaving? And then it dawned on me like, if you have, <coughs> excuse me, domesticators working for you, it's very difficult for you to fabric in your mind that your domesticated worker is your next door neighbor. So they decided we don't want this and they decided to leave. Now when they left, a very strange thing happened because I remember there was a bootleg liquor at that time. If anybody's here like 66, 67, it happens all the time, forgive me. <laughs> I always forget to turn this thing off. Got a nice sound to it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Big Dan, that's a guy from the Socialist. That's Big Dan up there in Boston, too. Well, listen, so, so like what I was saying was, I'm, I'm sitting back and, and I'm looking at them making this run. And I'm saying, why are they leaving? And they had this King Kong, as I said. King Kong was a bootleg liquor. And if I was to establish King Kong with anything that's happening in modern time, I would have to equate it to PCP. Everybody know what PCP was, that hallucinative, tranquilizer for elephants or what have you. And these guys used to get up on the roof, and, and Oscar, I know you know what I'm talking about. 
They would get up on the roof and they would think that they could fly. Some of them would fly in the backyard. Some of them would fly right out on Lenox Avenue, straight to their death. I went to sleep. Just like I said, white flight took, <coughs> took place. I went to sleep another night. I woke up. King Kong was dead and Heron was born. As soon as the white folks left, they said, we got this dope. Just like you look at the Godfather movie, they said, give it to the niggas. Well, it wasn't just in the movies. It was reality. It was real. And all of a sudden, Harlem was saturated. Like we was the test pilot to see whether if we could pull it off here, we could go to South Side of Chicago, we can go to Detroit, we can go to West L.A., South Central. And we got the market gone. And I began to study what was happening with the drugs. I looked at the drugs. I looked at so many beautiful people that had strong minds and wills and had a future that went down to the drugs. So I was on this quest at that time. Let me find out why. Why would you go to the drugs? Now, mind you, my father was as strong as that fist that I put in the sky in Mexico. He was a stern, strong black man. And he looked at me when someone told him, say, Earl, your son, <coughs> excuse me, is running with those junkies. You need to talk to him. Well, my father got a hold of me. He told me, he said, son, I understand you running with those junkies. He said, let me tell you something, son. Without a doubt, I brought you here. I will take you away from here if I find that you're running with these junkies. Based on his concern and his love for me. But I had this quest. So my thing was to make sure whatever I did, it never got to my father or my mother. So I didn't want to put no burden on them, and I didn't want to put no burden on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go to the roof, and I would talk to these junkies about, why would you shoot? Look at your father before you. Look at your older brother. Look at your sister. Look at them now. Why would you shoot these drugs? I said, and by the way, my father said that you guys take these drugs and put them on kids. One of the junkies looked at me and said, nah, your father lying to you, son. Say, uh, any drugs we have is our drugs. You got to get your own drugs. <laughs> said, okay, cool. And then I asked, why do you shoot it? And one of the older junkies stepped up to me and he said to me, which was profound then and is more profound now. He said to me, he said, John, he said, do you know what it's like as a black man in America? I said, no, explain to me. <coughs> he said, when it gets to the point in life, when you have a wife, and average kids in a black family in New York when I was coming up, four to five kids. You have a wife, you got four or five kids in your household. You can't get a decent job. When you go out and try and get a decent job, they tell you that you're not qualified. And then they give you a substandard job, and then they give you even more substandard pay. So then when you sit back and you say, I want better, they tell you that you're not qualified to obtain a better job, go to school. Well, it wasn't like you go down to NYU at that time and register and you go to school. You had to go through certain hoops to get there. Most of us couldn't get through the maze to get to NYU or Columbia University or UCLA or whatever school it might be. And then those of us that did sneak through and got through the maze, when we got those degrees and felt good about ourselves, who we are, we came back. They said, oh, you have a degree, uh, but unfortunately we can't hire you because we can't pay you. Why can't you pay me? Because you're overqualified. That was a standard rule. And then the man said to me, he said, you know, John, he said, now when you hear this, but at the same time, you're the captain of the ship. And your first mate is your wife. She wants you to still do your job as the captain of the ship. Go out and earn that money. Come back to support your family. So you don't want to disrespect your wife. You go out and look for a job, but you know it ain't no job, so you might go to your friend's house. And then your friend tell you, say, hey, man, somebody turn me on to something new. And then you start chipping with this new product. Why? Because your daughter came to you and said, Daddy, next week is my birthday. You remember that dress you promised me? Because when I was coming up, girls didn't wear jeans. They might have wore the same dress every day, but it was a clean dress. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. day they had a dress on. Yeah. Daddy, it's my birthday. Are you going to buy me that dress that you promised me? Yeah, baby girl, I'm going to get you that dress. And he walks down the hall in the apartment, and he puts it in his hand in his pocket, and he got nothing but holes in it. The next day, his son comes home from school and says, Daddy, they told me if I don't get any PE shoes, any tennis shoes, which was Converse at the time, 
If I don't get me a pair of Converse, Daddy, I'm going to fail my PE class. Now it's infringing upon his education. It ain't a social thing like, Daddy, can I get that dress for my birthday? It's his education. You going to be able to get me those tennis shoes, Dad? Yes, son, I'm going to get you. And now he goes down the hall again and reaches in his other pocket and his hand and went down to his kneecap because he got bigger holes. Now, the next day, his wife come and say, honey, we've been married for 15 years. Our anniversary is tomorrow. What are we going to do? Knowing that he don't have anything. Now, this is the lowest in self-esteem that a man can have because now he's starting to look at his life in terms of, I'm not a husband to my wife. I'm not a father to my kids. And every time I get up in the morning to go brush these teeth of mine, I find that I like the guy in the mirror even less. I don't have no respect for myself anymore. I don't like myself anymore. And then here's someone dingling heroin in your face, say, try this, you can forget who you are. So we took drugs back in the, 60s, uh, in the 40s, in the 50s, for escapism. It's not like what's happening today. People want to take drugs because they think it's a social trip. That's because our kids got a whack. A lot of our kids, a lot of you youngsters in this university right now, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Individuals came through school, the first gate, and went through the back gate. And then you have to ask yourself, did they go to school or did they go through school? Mm. Many of them should be sitting right here with you at NYU. Mm. So as I'm matriculating on through life, I'm beginning to look at the different agencies, the police department, the sheriff's department, the medical department, the fire department. And the fire department was one that struck me because it was a young fella that came from PS5, right there on 140th Street and 8th Avenue. Come on for lunch with me. I go to my father's shop, we have lunch. He go upstairs, have lunch, and say, man, I gotta talk to my father, I'll see you later. He went on back to school. I'm there 20 minutes later, his mom put some beans and some rice on the stove. When you walk in any New York apartment, you know how it is. You walk in, you got four or five bedrooms in the back, and the kitchen is to the left or to the right, as soon as you walk in that door. Mm. Fire department was called. Somebody pulled a fire alarm. At that time, I'm maybe 10 years old. Fire department come. They go in. They chop up every piece of furniture, water down every piece of clothes, threw it out in the alley in the back, threw it all out on Lenox Avenue in the front. And I remember going to my father and pulling my father and saying, Pop, why did they uh, chop up all the people's furniture like that? My father looked at me as though, you're crazy, son. What do you mean, why did they do it? It's a fire. I said, no, daddy, come outside. Let me show you something. No, nah, son, I'm too busy. No, nah, daddy, you need to stop. Come now. Thank God we had the love that my father had enough respect for me that he would listen and come, as I had to have that respect for him and listen to him as well. Mm -hmm. That's why I said he taught me, and I taught him too. When he got outside, I said, Pop, where's the fire? Show me something burnt. And my daddy looked at me, and he looked at the fire chief over there, and he went over to him. And when he went to him, I didn't have to go to the fire chief. All I did was stay back and look. Mm. You know what I saw when I looked? I saw that I was not represented. Because if I was represented as a fireman at that particular time, and that was taking place, I'd have had the check. Whoa, what are you doing? Why are you chopping this up? But because I wasn't there, there was no one there to put up the safeguard and say what you're doing is unnecessary. That happened in the police department with us. That happened in the educational system with us. That happened right there in the medical system with us. That happened in the employment lines with us because we didn't have anyone in the system to represent us. 10 years old. I wasn't 20 years old. I wasn't 40 years old. 10 years old. I saw that. How could I see it and so many people miss it? Well, the thing that I learned early in the game was that life is a game. Education is a game. Any game. I don't care if it's pool. I don't care if it's shooting marbles. What do you do in a game? What's the object of the game? Win. To win. How do you go about winning? You got to know the game rules. Most of us in society do not know the game, especially for freedom fighters. We got to know the rules if we want to win the game. I learned the rules real early. My old man said, son, it's a circle. 
So you can get on the edge of the circle, you can dodge the line going around the circle. He said, but if you get out the circle, that might be fine and dandy too. But with one exception, there's no guarantees you're going to get back in. So I stayed in the circle. I learned the game. When it came time for me to push the buttons and realize what rights I had, I dealt with it. Now, here's something that Dave likes, this story that I have about <coughs> 48 hours. He always tell me, man, drop this story about 48 hours. <laughs> and on the Internet, it's a big thing, 48 hours, like I made a sitcom, 48 hours. Well, what happened was, <coughs> y'all have to forgive me, I'm still fighting a bad cold. What happened was, when I was a kid, in the project, I lived right up the street, 153rd, Holland River Houses. And I went one day and I talked to my mom. I said, Mom, how come you never come downstairs and sit on the bench and talk to all the other mothers downstairs? Are you stuck up? <laughs> my mother kind of leaned in, because I didn't realize what I was saying to her at the time. She kind of leaned in and she said to me, she says, what did you say? <laughs> one more time, are you stuck up? And I looked at my mother and I could see the water come up in my mother's eyes. And my mother looked at me, she said, son, I never thought I was better than anyone. I never raised my kids to think that I was better than anyone. That's why if you ever ask me, say, John, well, who are you? My idea wasn't to be no activist. My idea wasn't to be no symbol in the Olympics. I just wanted to be Earl Carlos' son, my daddy's son, no more, no less. So my mother said, I don't go downstairs because of caterpillars, an insect. Caterpillars. You mean you're not going downstairs because of caterpillars? And my mother said, son, I work at Bellevue Hospital in the operating room. You have to be sterile in the operating room. Do you remember what happens to a caterpillar when it falls out the tree and it hits your neck and it hits your arm? They were so fragile, as soon as you touch it, it busts on you. And once it busts you in the sab that's in them, by the time you popped it on your neck and moved your hand, you got a rash running up and down your neck. And when my mother said that, it wasn't no thought about it. I've experienced it many times myself. So I said, you know, it's not fair that my mother should have to stay cooped up in the house. Something needs to be done. So at that time, I think I was like 13, 14 years old. I went to the manager's office. Come in. We have a problem, sir. What's the problem? These caterpillars. What do you mean the caterpillars? I said, we have too many caterpillars and you're not doing anything about them. Get out of my office. You don't belong in here. I said, I'm not going nowhere. I live here. I'm entitled to come in and talk about this. He pushed a little trap button under the desk, the panic button, they call it. Next thing you know, the police, the project police come in and they had an old black guard. He was like the gray suit. He come in. They grabbed me. John, you need to come out. I said, whoa, wait a minute. No, you need to come out now. Well, I broke away. And I looked at my man. I told him, I said, hey, man, let me tell you something. I have a right to be here. But also, I got a right to tell you this. You got 48 hours. You got 48 hours. He said, so the, the cop said to me, he said, are you threatening him? I said, no, sir. I would never threaten him, but it's a money back guarantee. He got 48 to take care of it. Now, how did I learn about 48 hours? Because I got in the mix in a lot of things in my life, and when my father got wind of what I did, my father raised me on the 48-hour theory. <laughs> like I listened to Miss, Miss uh, I'll send over there, uh, Kareem's daughter, and I think about her grandfather. When I got in the situation and he came and he wore that butt out, and while he was at the closing end of wearing that butt out, he said, I'm calling your father so he can finish the job. <laughs> so I understood what 40 hours 48 hours meant. If you can tell me something to make me understand what you did was logical, you got a problem. So I grew up in that theory. So I told the project manager, say, you got that 48. Well, when 49 hours came by, I went to all the women that sit downstairs, all the kids was playing the pit down there. I said, do me a favor. Today, it might be a problem out here. Go to the other end of the project or go upstairs. Oh, crazy Johnny getting ready to do something. I was always classified as crazy because I was always going upstream. Mm. You know, you have to be classified as crazy if you're doing the opposite of what everybody else is doing. You know, like, I'm afraid to offend my offender. That's what a lot of people think. 
I'm afraid to offend my oppressor. And it's like saying, you got your foot on my neck, I can hardly breathe, but I don't want to offend you by asking you to take your foot off. Ooh. You know? Ooh. That's how deep yeah. it is. So Ooh. I sat back and I looked at him and, and I said, okay, after the people moved, I went down to a gas station. My partner's father owned the gas station right there on 153rd, 151st and 7th Avenue. I went to Mr. Gardner and said, Mr. Gardner, uh, my father sent me to get some gasoline. He said, he sent you to get some gasoline. He said, where's the can? I said, he didn't give me no can. He said, but uh, he'll take care of it. So he said, well, go get you a can. I got a can. And then he said, well, where's the money? I said, he said he'll take care of it, Mr. Gardner. He said, all right. He gave me the can, and I went back in the project. I hit the first tree. Back that time, we used to have stick matches. You know, moms always had them boxes of stick matches. Well, I always had a pocket full of them. I used to like to hit it on the zipper and light them up at night. I hit the first tree with that gasoline, and I hit the zipper and threw it, and the tree said, <laughs> Stings my face. So I jumped back, but I couldn't stop. I ran to the next tree. I doused that one. I couldn't get the match out of my pocket before the fire leaped over there. So by that time, when the third tree come, here come the police and the guard. They were running up on me. But when I hit the tree, they didn't know whether we should jump on them or whether we should start putting the fire out. And when they hesitated, I went to the fourth tree. <laughs> by the fourth tree, they dove on me. They took me to court. Now, mind you, as a youngster or a teenager, it doesn't matter. When you do something that's out of the ordinary, your parents have a tendency to become highly embarrassed, highly frustrated, and highly confused. So now my mother said, I'm not going to court with him. You take him or you go to court with him. But the seed was because of my mother not coming downstairs. But I didn't discuss it with my mom. And I was kind of like locked jaw because my father was upset. When a man's upset, you don't say nothing. We get to the court, and the first thing the judge looks at my father, he says, uh, Mr. Carlos, uh, does your son have any mental deficiencies? <laughs> so my father said, well, not to my knowledge. He seems to be all right. Uh, well, why would he do something like what he did? Wasn't he concerned about the safety of the people in the community and the kids out, that was out there playing such as his age? And my father said, you know something, Yana? That's a very good question. I'd like to know too, but he's right here. Why don't we ask him? <laughs> the judge looked at me and said, young man, why did you do what you did? And I went to explain to him about my mother and the situation. I went to explain to him that I went to the managing the project and he didn't want to hear nothing I had to say because I guess I'm too young to be intelligent. Hmm. Get on out of my office. I said, Yon, I gave the man 48 hours to get it together. I said, because I didn't feel that my mother should have to sacrifice her days sitting in the window looking out. And I explained to him where my mother worked. I said, to you, I said, Your Honor, I go up to the white area, high bridge pool. Every chance we had, we would go up there and get away from the black pool because we wanted to go up there and integrate. I said, when we went through that project, they, they had the same trees we had. I said, but every summer, it was up spraying. I said, they sprayed in my project one time when I was a baby when I came here. They looked at my father. He said, Mr. Carlos, uh, when the last time you remember them spraying? He said, well, my recollection, my son is right. They haven't sprayed since he was like eight years old when we moved here. He looked at the manager. He said, the manager, he said, when's the last time you sprayed? He said, well, I, 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 Your Honor, I don't have the paperwork before me. The judge said, well, that's very good. Let's take a recess. When you come back, you make sure you got all your records. But the judge was a smart judge. He sent him to get the records, but the judge picked up the phone, told the bailiff, said, hey, I want you to call down to the housing authority because we were going to get a check. And when the man came back, he came back with a folder about as thin as this. He said, well, Jan, I couldn't get to the real records right now, and this is all I have right now. And he said, well, uh, someone here from the housing authority, and the guy said, I'm here. He said, come up. The guy had a folder. He said, yes, sir, we've been paying this man for X amount of years. Uh, they had a substance, a, a, sti a stipend to spray the trees. Mm. All these years, just because we were people of color living in the Harlem River houses, he didn't have no concern about our health or our well-being. And he was pocketing the money or doing something else with the money. Mm. Now, here's the heavy part. The, third, the judge commended me like I'm a hero. And I felt good to be vindicated from being the villain of the crazy Johnny. 
But the greatest thing was when I left and I went out in the court in the hall, we was giving ready to leave. My daddy looked at me and he told me, he said, he said, son, he said, you did a lot of things in your life. He said, most of them I didn't understand and I whipped your butt. He said, you never complained, you never said anything, but you never backed up from what you believed in. Mm -hmm. He said, every time when the dust settled, you were right in what you did. And here you are right now in the courthouse and the judge is telling you that you were right in what you did again. It wasn't me. It was God telling me that you have a right to stand for what you believe in, what you think is unfair to you. And anybody, everybody in this room have the same right. You might not reap the benefit now. My mother's 96 years old now. She's reaping the benefit of knowing that her son stood up for her when she didn't know to stand up for herself. Mm. You can do the same thing. You can make your kids do the same thing. I went on from there, and I got involved and met Adam Clayton Powell at his church and, and found out what the, what the passing was all about. My dad told me about passing. What's passing, Daddy? Uh, that's Adam Clayton Powell. That's his daddy. Can't be his daddy. He look like you, Pop. That's a white man over there. No, that's his son. So that's his son. He said, he's not passing. And he did that. I always thought when he did that, something was wrong with his hand. I didn't fairly understand what he was saying. And I said to him, I said, what do you mean passing? He said, well, son, we had some fair-skinned blacks that passed to be white. And I said to him, they passed to be white. Are they ashamed of who they are? They don't want to be black? And my father said, no, son. It's not that they don't want to be black. He said, now, some of them are a little overzealous with it. He <laughs> said, but the majority of them go that way merely because they want a better standard of life. Anybody and everybody should want a better standard of life. When you sit back and you put that in perspective of modern day, those people that come in from Haiti, don't think they don't like Haiti. They want a better standard of life. Those that come in and risk their life coming across the water from Cuba, they ain't that they don't like Fidel. They want a better standard of life, but they got people to run the bullshit to you and tell you, oh, it's against communist country, it's against Castro. But I'll tell you what, I got Cuban family there. Castro don't charge me to get into the Yankee Stadium. <laughs> Castro don't charge me for medical. Castro don't charge me to go and get my education. Yep. Yep. But here in the United States, they tell me that that's a bad guy and what's over here is a good guy. So that's why I believe in Muhammad Ali say, hey, man, those people over here never did nothing to me. I remember my brothers was going in the war. They was going, man, it's your patriotic duty to go in the military. I looked at my brother and said, why are you going? One said, man, I'm going to defend the country. The other one said, I'm going because I'm going to see the world. I said to him, I said, well, I'll tell you what, man, I'm going to pick up arms when they come across the George Washington Bridge. <laughs> and tell Larry, I ain't got no problem. Well, you, I'm going to see the world. I said, well, I'm going to see the world another way. Mm. Then I left Adam Clayton Powell alone and met Malcolm X. Yeah. Here's a brother that on the radio I heard him speak at a young age, and, and I was hypnotized, stigmatized. And I said, God, who is this guy here talking so terrific. He was talking to my soul because that's the way my soul felt. And then when he came down to 116th Street and started the mosque and, and, and came in and had these sessions every weekend, I was drop anything and everything I was doing to get there to make sure I'm in the front to listen to him. Not only did I sit there and listen to him and marvel about the fact that he was a lone rider, didn't nobody talk like him, didn't nobody have the conviction like he had in terms of saying, be proud of who you are. Stand up for your rights. Step up into their face and let them know. And when he came down, he said, I'm not a violent man. He said, but any means necessary to protect my family. He didn't say any means because I'm on the street. He was in his house when they was coming, blowing his house up. Any means necessary to protect me and mine. That's the character that I have. I didn't protect my wife. If I didn't protect my kid, you know who I would revert back to in my mind? When I seen the civil rights struggle, and I seen them knock black women down that was pregnant, or just knock them down and drag them by their hair and put dogs on them, and I saw black men stand there passively because they had fear for reprisal upon themselves. So they let them do that to their women. I couldn't stand that, but I was too young to say anything. I didn't have a vehicle to say it. So I'm building, I'm building, I'm building. I left Malcolm X behind. 
And I started building this track game because God is telling me, say, hey, man, you're going to have a platform one day, but you got to earn your right to be on this platform. You got to train and perfect your game, as Dr. Connell West said. It wasn't about me learning track and running track. I had to perfect my game. That was my game, track and field. I had to bring it to the best to the point where I took myself and I took that track and consummated a marriage. I knew everything about my baby girl on that track, and my baby girl knew everything about me. So I knew how to lean on that turn. I knew how to raise up. I knew how to caress her. She knew how to caress me. I knew how to tell the officials what time I ran before they could tell me what time I ran. So when I got to the point where I was raising up, I didn't go to the Olympic Games for medals. Hmm. All the medals that I won in high school was for the girls. I, I didn't medal. What, is, what, what a medal mean to me? Hey, baby, you like a medal? Here, you got a medal. I'll pin it right on it. Okay? My medal that I won at the Olympic Games didn't mean jack to me, even though they came and told the world they took my medal. Mm -hmm. But I told them, I said, let me tell you something. The medal don't mean nothing to John Carlos. But I earned this medal. You didn't give it to me. You didn't knock on my door and say, we got an open slot. We're going to put you in the team. They said a standard. I met the standard. That's right. That's I said, right. this medal don't mean jack to John Carlos, but it might mean everything to my kids. So if you're coming to take my medal, bring the militia, because you're going to need them. So they backed away. But when they backed away, they put the propaganda out there for 43 years. Right. If you get out of line, because they train you to go for the carrot, and that's that medal, the carrot. Mm -hmm. If you misbehave and you jump out the circle, we're going to take your medal away. I sat back and I looked at many individuals that was intimidated by that. So now I got the medal. I got all of this. But prior to getting the medal, we had, and I'm going to close it with this. We had an opportunity. I had this opportunity to meet Dr. King. Dr. King invited me to a meeting after I left Texas, East Texas State, where East Texas State was a beautiful university. It had just become integrated. Some of the people in the town weren't ready for integration. Some of the faculty members weren't ready for integration. But regardless of whether they were ready or not, it was here. And here, little lonely Johnny takes his wife and his newborn baby, and we say, hey, it's a new frontier for us. We got a new start in life. Let's go to East Texas State. When I went down there, I landed in Dallas Airport. As soon as I got off the airplane, I wasn't there five minutes before I realized that I made a mistake. And the biggest mistake was that I took my wife and my daughter with me. And I remember, if I get in a fight, it's one thing about protecting me, but it's another thing trying to protect mm -hmm. yourself and you're concerned about, are you really protecting your wife and kid? I walked into the airport, it was about the size of this building here. The big Dallas airport with a brownstone ranger, uh, the Texas ranger statue in the front. And I looked behind the Texas ranger statue and I saw restroom, white only. Well, that blew me away. I never seen nothing tell me about it. White only. White only. And I look at the white bathroom, it's pristine. I mean, it looked like they're frying eggs and they smell so good. <laughs> I looked over to the other one and say, colored. And it had running water on the floor, toilet paper running up and down the floor, gnats running up and down the floor. Now, mind you, they might say that black people is filthy and nasty. But I knew right away that that's a damn lie because my mother ain't never been filthy and nasty in my household. So for the, 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 the perception that they was trying to put out to the world by leaving that restroom like that, I knew better. Mm. I knew I made a mistake. Mm. But I went on through the Texas deal as long as I could, and I left. And I came back to New York, and I'm helping my mother paint the kitchen. Show you how God had me on this roller coaster. The phone rings. My mother picks up the phone, says, oh, is John Carlos in? Uh, this is Professor Edwards. I'd uh, like to talk to him. My mother said, well, John, is Professor Edwards on the phone? Uh, yeah, what's, what's up? Uh, is John, there's a meeting taking place downtown uh, at the Americana Hotel. We'd like to see whether you would have time to come. Someone asked me to invite you. I said, okay, let me ask my mom. I said, Mom, look here. Uh, they got this meeting going on. You think you can finish up? She said, son, go on. It's a big meeting. They requesting you go. Hmm. Now, my mother was just a diehard woman. She loved people, she loved life, and most of all, she loved her kids. Mm. 
I go down to the Americana Hotel and I look in and right away, like I say, my mother being a perfectionist, she's the type of woman to go buy a sofa, a beautiful sofa, and then put plastic on it and then you got to get a ticket to sit on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of y'all know about the same oh, Lord, situation, yeah. right? All right? That sounds like grandmama right, right there. So then the I get down to the hotel and this is my <laughs> second time in a major hotel. I'm sitting in the lobby and I'm looking, I'm looking at the chandelier and say, damn, I can show, take that to the pad. I'm looking at the pictures on the wall. I'm looking at the sofas and didn't think about how I could hook my mother's house up with this furniture. But I had to let that go. Yeah, that, yeah. And I go to the desk and I <laughs> ask them, I say, I'm looking for so-and-so. And they say, oh, yes, go to the room so-and-so. And I go in and I look and I knock on the door and a guy comes to the door and I'm in shock right away. Because this guy's face that I see was Dr. Young. Andrew Young. Andrew Young. And when I saw Andrew Young, I saw the face, but I was in a state of shock because I always thought Andrew Young was like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and when I saw how tall he was, I said, it's the face, but it can't be Andrew Young. And then I got to thinking right away, God, the guy that's taking his picture must be on his back. He's <laughs> shooting up every day. And they invited me into the room, and I see people in there from SCLC, SC Abernathy, and a few other people walking around in there, and they see I'm young. They see I'm a little nervous because I'm with these big wigs that my mom see on TV, but I still haven't put the dots together. Mm. I'm sitting there, they, would you like cookies? Would you like some sandwiches? Would you like juice, whatever? And I'm sitting there, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then about 20, 25 minutes later, the door opened, and here comes Dr. King, walks out the room. Whew. Whoa, blew me away. You know how your body temperatures get up like you're getting ready to pass out? <laughs> I mean, it was like a flash flood. <laughs> and I'm looking, and the first thing I'm saying, Damn, my mother needed to be a bug on my lapel or a rock in my pocket. Why? Because my mother thought that Dr. King was the first lieutenant that God sent to this planet to try and make some sense out of it. Mm. Now, here this man walked in, and he could see right away that something was wrong with me in terms of me being nervous. Mm. The man was so funny. And when I say funny, I mean he realized that he had loosened me up and everybody else in there. And he came out and I looked at him and I said, God, Dr. King could have been on Saturday Night Live. He could have been a stand-up comic, you know, because he was so cool with it. And then after he relaxed everybody, we went into this dialogue about the Olympic movement. And he realized that we were talking about doing this Olympic boycott. And the essence of the meeting was that he wanted to come out and support the Olympic boycott. He said, I don't want to be in charge. I want to be second in command under Harry Edwards because I think Professor, Professor Edwards is doing a fantastic job. However, I'm not going to make the announcement about this until I return from Memphis. And then he said, and incidentally, they sent me a letter, and they told me in this letter they got a bullet with my name on it, and I wouldn't have to wait long for it. So I listened to him in this conversation. So when the meeting's over, he asked, did I have any questions? Yeah, Dr. King, I got two questions. First question is, why would you support the Olympic boycott? He said to me, no, let me take that back. The first question was to him, Dr. King, if they said they sent a letter and they tell you they're going to take your life, why would you go back to Memphis? He looked at me, he smiled, he said, that's a good question. In the meantime, I used to wear shades all the time, dark shades, no tint at that time. But I always had a tendency, when I'm serious with somebody, I want the serious answer, I'll pull my glasses down because I want the eye-to-eye -eye contact. I'm looking at his eyes. And most everybody in here can understand why or what I'm looking for. What did I be? What would I be looking for? If a man tell you that somebody told you that they're going to kill you, are you supposed to be like a rock or are you supposed to be a little shaky? Well, I thought that the man might have a little shakiness too. But when I looked in his eyes, he was solid as that fist that I had in Mexico City. And not only that, when I looked deep in his eyes, he didn't have concern for himself as much as he had love for humanity. Mm. That was a strong move. And he looked at me and he said to me, he said, well, John, that's a good question. He said, here's the answer. I have to go back to Memphis and stand for those that can't stand for themselves. And John, I have to go back and stand for those that won't stand for themselves. You know how powerful that statement is? Mm. Here's individuals that want to stand, but they're being suppressed where they can't stand. 
And then there's here's other individuals that can stand. Those that get in the corporate office and they have to listen to the racist jokes in the office that can stand and, and maybe make a difference. They just feel that they don't have enough courage, mm. or as I say, basketballs to stand. <laughs> you understand? So he said, I have to go stand for them. And that came like full circle in my life because that's what I've been doing from the time I was a little knee high to a grasshopper. Fighting for those that couldn't fight for themselves, standing for those that wanted somebody to come in and cherry their deal. And then he said to me, See, you had two questions. I said, Oh, yes. I said, Dr. King, did you have a box? Did you play basketball? Did you, what did you do? He said, I can't shoot pool. I said, Well, why would you get involved in the Olympic movement? And he looked at me and said, That's a better question than the first one. I said to him, I said, Well, I don't understand. He said, Well, John, imagine this you in a, in a, in a lake and you're in a boat, and you're out in the middle of the lake, and he said, you're just sitting there, and everything is serene and quiet and still. He said, and you reach down into the boat, and you pick up a rock. He said, and you drop that rock in the water. He said, what happens? The first thing I'm thinking about is vibration. He said, yeah, waves. He said, do you know that that rock is the Olympic boycott? He said, if you boycott the Olympic Games, all the black athletes, all the athletes that might be sympathetic to the cause, he said, do you realize that that would send ripples throughout the world? He said, but even greater than that, he said, you know, the greatest part is that it's a nonviolent act. You don't have to shoot nobody. You don't have to kill nobody. You don't have to maim nobody. You don't have to put no bullets on. All you have to do is say, we choose not to compete. He said, imagine if the black soldiers in America and the wars that we've had just chose to step away from the war and say, I choose not to go. Do you think America would have won the wars that they've won? Mm. Understand? Mm. My father was in the First World War. Took a bullet here and took a bullet in his butt. I didn't find out until later. The bullet in his butt, he told, showed me when he was getting ready to die mm. because he had a debate with an officer because at that time in the First World War, blacks was there and they had white commanded officers. I told him, take the hill. My father said, hey, I don't mind taking the hill, but I'm tired of you telling us to take the hill and we giving life and you standing down here watching. Take the hill with us. They had some friction. The guys told him, say, Earl, come on, let's take this hill. Let's do the job. And he went up there, and my father said, he's crawling all up on the mud and barbed wire and so forth. He said, and all of a sudden, this blaze came through his buttocks. He said he knew the enemy was in front of him. Where's this coming from the back? When he looked back to see who it was, his officer that he had the friction with shot him. And then he said, in the meantime, the bullet in the hole came from the enemy when the enemy shot him in the jaw. Oh, so my old man telling me these things as a kid, Dr. King telling me the things that he told me, you can tell to step up when it's time to step up because my father made a commitment with his life. Dr. King was not in the war, but he made a commitment with his life. Malcolm X was not in the war, but he made a commitment with his life. These individuals didn't ask for no more in their lives than to have a fair playing field where all individuals had an opportunity to step up in life Good. and have an equal shot. Good. Gandhi didn't have no more than the sheep. I'm so sorry. I know, but <laughs> give me this out. Gandhi didn't have no more than the sheep. Mm -hmm. Little frail man. But Gandhi did a lot, and he did it in a nonviolent way. With all the examples that they have, I shouldn't have to be standing alone. What's wrong with y'all? Let's win this war. I'm sorry, brother. Yes, brother. No, 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 no. Oh, brother. Oh, that's strong, that's strong, that's strong. Exactly. Here we go. We have time for question and answer. Wrong, wrong, brother. Oh, no. Good. You kind of give me food. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Hey. See, you're supposed to kill some man you go. Oh, I, I thought I had uh, an easy job, and I do. Um, but uh, I will definitely want a little bit of time for uh, all of you, to, some of you, to ask some questions. So this is definitely the time for Q&A. So uh, we have a few mics, uh, one up here, one back there, and uh, that's it. <laughs> and uh, so when you're ready, uh, if you have a booming voice, if you promise to boom, you're, uh, to say it, say it loudly, uh, stand up. If not, go. please go to the mic. Uh, John, um, probably in the book, take us back to standing on the metal stand, you and Tommy. What are you thinking at that moment when they play the national, national anthem and you 
First, first and foremost, I thought about a vision that I had when I was seven years old where God put me in an arena where everybody was excited about something I did. And I, when I say put me in this arena, I was seven years old. He didn't make me a teenager. He didn't make me an adult. He made me there at seven years old. Everybody was yippee kaye about something that I did or somebody did. When it dawned on me that they were applauding for me and I went to wave, the sunshine turned to stormy weather. They stopped applauding. They started booing. They started spitting. They started throwing. 23, uh, 15 years later, when I turned 23, that's the exact same thing that happened in Mexico City. That's the first thing that came to my mind. The second thing that came to my mind is the trials and tribulations my father told me about the war. Dr. King, the things that he told me, and then just my own experience in growing up in Harlem as a kid. And you know where David made a statement? The first thing I thought the minute I stepped down off of that podium is that I'm a free man and they'll never ever put shackles on John Collins again. All right. Let's go right over here. Okay. Um, uh, nice to meet you, uh, Mr. Carlos. Um, I, uh, I met two of your Olympic teammates. Uh, um, one time I trained a couple of summers with uh, Norman Tate. He was okay. on the triple jump, and uh, man, I trained right? with him for a couple of summers. And uh, I met Lee Evans at the 1984 Olympics. Yeah. I was on the um, – I was a member of the volunteer 1984 Olympic staff in Los Angeles. So um, my questions, a couple, two questions. Um, didn't uh, Lou Alcinda actually do, do the boycott? And um, what do you think of Usain Bolt? Uh -oh. I mean, didn't you read the Times? <laughs> Did you read the LA Times the other day? The New York Times. New York Times. It was New York Times, right. Did you read Usain that paper? Bolt. Not all the time. I, I, the guy asked me the same question, and I told him, I said, man, I do not think about Usain Bolt. Oh, okay. Well, you, you are. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's good. That's no, okay. I don't, you know, I don't give no thought to you saying, but let him do his thing. And I have reservations, but I'm not going to speak on it because uh, let time take its course and we'll see down the end about you saying, Okay, Lou Alcindor part then. Now, Lou Alcindor, we grew up together in these streets right here. Okay, uh, leading up to the games, we had some discussion. And uh, I told Kareem, I said, look, if, if I was you, I wouldn't go to the games. And... I said to him, I said, you have to remember, Kareem, that the NBA is riding on your back right now. Mm -hmm. They're not going to put you through any oppression because you are the NBA. The NBA is hanging on your shoulder, okay. hoping that you would come and play in the NBA because they will make mega and they will have birth through you. I said, so your choice is yours. We had discussions. He said, well, what would I tell I said, man, you're going back to school. School is more important to you than the Olympic Games. And that's exactly where he came from. He went on, he did it, he got his degree. Kareem is a very articulate individual, oh, very yeah. smart individual. Oh, yes, he Understand? Yeah. They didn't miss Kareem at those games. And Kareem, when it all said and done, he didn't miss those games either. No, he did well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. There's, oh. Go on, go on, go on. Make there, there. There's a story of when Kareem that summer was on the Today Show and Joe Garagiola was asking him, asked him the question, why aren't you going to the games? And Kareem said, I have reservations about some of the policies of my country. And right there on the Today Show, Joe Garagiola said to him, well, maybe you should think about finding another country. And it's, it's interesting that they, what the things they got away with. And it reminds me, people have heard of Brent Musburger? Yeah. yeah. Very famous sportscaster. Brent Musburger, in 1968, after John and Tommy did what they did, he called them, quote unquote, black skin stormtroopers at that time. So... What Tell them, the, make some of them understand, because all I'm doing is understand what a black skin stormtrooper is. Tell them what a stormtrooper is. It's, it's, this, is this is fraught with irony here, but um, they compared them to Nazis. Uh, the LA Times described what they did on the medal stand as a Nazi-like salute. Now, in addition to this being slander, and this is also we suffered in 68 because there was no democracy now then. There was no internet, websites, whatever. So, so the media, just from a couple of sources, painted them as devils, as dragons for doing what they did and said they had a Nazi-like salute. Now, the tremendous irony of this is that one of the people they were standing against was Avery Brundage, who was an actual bona fide Nazi sympathizer. And so there you go. That's just a little moment there. Yeah, Brent question. Musburger, don't like him. Question in the back. Hi, um, I just want to... Uh, tell you a quick story. In uh, 1968, I was uh, 17 years old at Jamaica High School. Now, Bob Beeman, uh, who in 1968 also broke the world, the uh, long jump record by about a mile and a half in the Olympics, 
um, had graduated the year before I got there. Now, the, the other connection that I sort of thought of this morning um, relating to you, Cornell, was that my coach at Jamaica High School was Larry Ellis, who ended up at Princeton, who coached the uh, USA track and field oh, team yes, in the yes. 84 Olympics. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing was, was that after the 68 Olympics, when we went back to school that fall, there was, the teacher strike was happening in New York. It was, the, it was a racist strike because it was a strike where the teachers were trying to fight community control of the schools in New York City. And it was the one picket line I've ever crossed in my life. And when we went back to school, uh, there was activism all over the city and around the world, as you had said before. And one of the first things that uh, the administration at my high school came up to me and said, you have to make a decision. You're either going to run track or you're going to stop being a political activist. And the thing, the, the image that came to my mind was the picture of you two guys up on the medal stand. Right. And you said Larry Ellis conveyed this to you? Yep. I'll tell you a story when you get done. Sure. <laughs> get so, to your question. So a, anyway, but I, I just wanted to thank you for the inspiration that you gave me to make it really easy to say, I'm not running track this year. I got to do what I got to do. Yeah, yeah, Larry. Maybe tell him afterwards in the corner. Or something. No, we, we we should point out, brother Phil, one of the great long jumpers is actually here. Just stand up, yeah, brother. Phil, Phil Shinnick. Phil right. Shinnick. Yeah. Two-time two Olympian, two-time Olympic champion. Yes, indeed, indeed. World record holder. <laughs> I want to say re really quickly that unfortunately we can only take two more questions because we need time to uh, 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 sell books. Things oh. of that nature. So, but you can still, you can still uh, come up and obviously ask a, ask a question to we got this Carlos or Dr. West. Pretty young lady are. right here. All right. Hi, my name's Alicia. Um, so I was expressing to someone today that one of my favorite things in life is to witness folks find their space in revolution. Um, and I wanted to know from you, from your acting, from your hearing, um, and from your speaking, how how we as students and as um, individuals in this society can push people out of thinking and theorizing into acting and changing? Well, you know, I would say uh, self-directive. You have to, first of all, find out who you are. And once you know who you are, it's about where your heart is. You understand? When you make an ultimate commitment and see someone realize that, say, this individual is committed to the point where they're willing to sacrifice their life for the betterment of mankind. Those individuals, like, uh, for instance, walking down there at... Uh, Occupy Wall Street. There's so many people in the circle, in the square, but then there's many more people walking by. I've seen them walk by and stand there for 20 minutes, That's right. 30 oh, minutes, sorry. and they're debating in their minds as, do I have the courage? Do I have the character? Because everything they're standing for is the same thing that I'm dealing with every day in my life as to whether I'm going to have a job tomorrow. How am I going to pay my mortgage? I'm losing my house. My kids went to school. They asked them for debt for my kid to pay the student loans, and they can't even get a job to pay that. The cost of my baby girl going to go to college is going up. How am I going to do it? So many people are questioning themselves in terms of whether I have the, the vigor or the audacity to take part in something that might make a difference in society. So once they find out who they are and realize what their options are, there's more and, people, more, and more people eating the soup every day. Thank you so much. You gotta hit the mic, man. Good evening. Oh, go ahead. I think. Go ahead. Good evening, Zakia Ali, high school teacher in Brooklyn at the High School for Global Citizenship. Woo! Yeah. Right um, yeah. I, I listened to your story, Mr. Carlos, and I love the stories about you and your daddy because you talk about him. I mean, it's just so endearing and it's just so sweet. And I just love it. And I have a question. You said that you met my, my Malcolm X, you had the opportunity to be around him, you had the opportunity to be around Dr. Martin Luther King, and both of these men died before they even, even were able to see 40. So my mm -hmm. question to you is, what gave you the courage to actually want to look forward to another year when you knew that you were living in such a hostile environment as a black man? And what advice would you give to black men today living in America when it's still such a hostile environment? You know, when you, when you sit back and you think about the two individuals that you mentioned, they live a long, powerful life. It wasn't as long as they might have liked to live it. But yet, and still in spirit and knowledge and history, they're living a greater life now than they did when they was living in the flesh. It's not about what you do here as much as it is about the fact that what you did do, they will remember. Because most people 
are not going to step up to the plate and say, man, you tell me that I can't even get a bunt, but I'm telling you I'm here and I can get a home run. Those individuals stood there to swipe at them home runs. They're icons because they rose above the norm. Anyone in here has the same ability to rise. We got Dr. Martin Luther King sitting in this audience. We got Harriet Tubman sitting right in this audience. You understand? We got Rosa Parks sitting in this audience. Mm -hmm. We got so many legends from the past sitting right here in this audience. Only difference is those individuals got in touch with the man or the woman in the mirror. That's all we need to do is find out who we are and find out how much depth we have. Pick up the baton. That's right. Eat the soup. Eat the soup. I like pick up the baton. Unfortunately, we have to, uh, field. We have to end it right there. Uh, you, this, will, you will definitely have an opportunity to speak uh, to all the panelists. This is a uh, We quick have to question. end. I'm sorry. We have to end. I'm oh, sorry. Quick, one more, just because he's an old friend of Dr. Carlos. Okay. All right. La last this is question. a quick question. Uh, are you familiar with a gentleman named Charlie Specks Green from Nebraska? Sprinter? Charlie you mean, Green? You mean Captain Green? I, I didn't know if he was the captain. Yes, he's the captain, yes. But I made a bet, and I want to see if I could collect. Uh, <laughs> they had some... A game's called Martin Luther King Games at Philadelphia. Yes, sir. And you were running the 100 against him. Yes, and sir. as you were warming up, you waved in the stands. So people were wondering who you were waving to. And you said you was waving to Charlie Green's family because the next time you come past there, you'll be going so fast, you won't have any time to say nothing to him. Is that true? That's true. Unfortunately, I had a bad day that day and Charlie whipped me. <laughs> so I won my bet. Oh, I was waving to the family, absolutely. But I stumbled out the blocks and I couldn't get myself together for the last five meters, so uh, he won. But that was the only one he won in his career, too. <laughs> got one more, one more, one more, one more. One more, one more, that's another it. Call, another call, another call. I'm glad that I got on on this because I was in training in the Army after being drafted in October of 68. I knew they was coming down with orders to go to Vietnam. I did not want to go, but I didn't know if I had the courage to say no. Mm. And what you all did helped to give me the courage to stand up and say, following what Ali had said, but you all doing it right around the time I was dealing with that decision, allowed me to say, I have no fight in Vietnam. My war is not there. And so I want to give you props for that, because that step put me on the road to becoming a revolutionary. And I want to say to the young people here, my man is right. There is injustice all around us. You got to find the courage to stand up and say no to it. Dr. West and I have called for stopping, stop and frisk Friday, October 21st. You want to be a part of it, come talk to us. But y'all need to find the courage to look square in the face of injustice and say, I will not suffer under it, and I will not let it go down and stand by si silently and watch it. You know, that's okay. what I learned from what this man did. And I Thank think you, that's Carl. a lesson we all need to take. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You'll have an opportunity to speak with all the panelists. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, let me just say, let me just say one thing. Hey, listen, guys, uh, my anniversary is this Sunday. It is 43 years this Sunday, October 16th. This T-shirt that I have on, we will be having something on the internet where you guys can buy this T-shirt. If you don't buy it for yourself because you don't have no heart, buy it for your kids because I know you got all the heart. Thank you. <laughs> Well, if you have been moved or inspired oh, by anything right, that you heard man. tonight, let's give everyone a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Let's let them hear it. Come on now. Absolutely. Yeah.